Uh, thank you. Uh, I would like to begin by thanking our hosts for their very kind invitation. I am very, um, it's a great pleasure and an honor for me to be uh, speaking to you here and also to get the opportunity to, to see this wonderful city. And um, I will be talking to you about Ankara, and Ankara is my hometown where I live and teach, and it is also the most of my scholarly. Um, studies because it, it houses most of the architecture and um, modern heritage of the Republic in Turkey and the modern architecture of the 20th century in Turkey and the city Ankara has been keeping me quite busy lately I can talk about a very similar increase in the you know um, in the all events and publications related to the modern heritage of the city uh, I can say that I counted before I come here, it's, it's like the seventh that I've been attending this year. But I'm afraid to say that it's not because of a, you know, a positive atmosphere like we have in here. In fact, quite the opposite. It's not because we are doing a very well job conserving the modern heritage in Ankara that we keep on discussing that. It reminds me, as a matter of fact, an old joke that I read somewhere, and I don't remember where, but the author was... Uh, listing all the names that received prizes of Nobel Peace Prizes and other prizes for their you know, great efforts to bring peace to the Middle East. And then he was concluding, concluding that since there are a lot of great people you know, bringing peace to the Middle East, that must be the most peaceful place on earth. So <laughs> the, the condition of modern heritage in Ankara is very much like that. It's like peace in the Middle East. So that's why we need to keep discussing it. We need to keep bringing it up, and I'm, I'm thanking for the opportunity here. So, uh, those people who try to, you know, generate some awareness uh, about the modern heritage in Ankara usually discuss that the identity of Ankara and its significance within the border, broader sorry, collective memory is very much tied to that. Uh, this city meant a lot for the whole Republican Revolution, especially in the period from the early 1920s to the late 1930s, which is usually referred as the early Republican period. Hence, all the sites and buildings dating back to that period are the materials, conveyors, that connect future generations to the history of the nation in general. Such discussion has to be made each time, uh, simply because the average citizen, the ordinary citizen, has only the lost connection to the memory of past identity. Uh, it is, of course, a huge problem for, for the sake of the modern heritage, but some people also argue that um, it is just an indication that Ankara has moved on. Well, uh, it's, a, it's a very valid discussion, and it's an ongoing discussion, and in, no one in that discussion re is really claiming Ankara is a model of urban beauty, but some say that it's a good thing that it has moved on, so that it's not, you know, frozen in its golden age, so it's an alive city. And the others uh, discuss that it has moved on just too fast and in a very disoriented way. So, Ankara is, in fact, one of the earlier examples of the 20th century practice of building a new designed capital city. In that sense, it belongs to the same group with Canberra, Brasilia, and Islamabad. These are usually names that are mentioned when uh, the history of Ankara is uh, discussed, and many scholars who compare these cases emphasize that they all share the condition of being not only new cities, but more importantly, they are alternatives to the old primary centers. They all exhibit the expression to distance the new administration from a troubled past, which in many cases uh, is a colonial one, both symbolically and physically. And in our case, it is Ankara uh, against Istanbul. When the Ottoman Empire came out on the losing side of the First World War, a large-scale invasion of Turkish mother law, uh, motherland followed the peace agreement, and then a national resistance was organized, led by eminent officers of the Ottoman army, Atatürk being one of them. And after the three-year-long war of independence, the Republic of Turkey was born. The Republic was proclaimed by the government of Ankara, which was seated in the city in Ankara, is a matter of uh, circumstances of the ongoing war. It was logistically well situated, it had railroad connection, and it had a supportive community. 
But beyond any material reasoning, uh, the decision to make the city a permanent capital was a very neat political statement, and it was a clear setting of the ideological frame that the Republic wished to begin with a clean slate. Ankara provided the Republicans the ethos of newness that they wanted. The Republican narrative on Ankara, when the early documents of uh, 20s to 30s are, or even uh, extending to 50s are examined, uh, we can see that uh, the narrative is very much built upon that ethos. It is quite true on the one hand that when the national resistance settled in Ankara, Ankara is a small town of some 20,000 people, was in a fairly miserable state. However, it was not typical for the town. In its Ankara, and its history, Ankara had much better days. It had been an important part of the Hittite and Phrygian kingdoms, and the capital city of the province of Galatia during the Romans. It continued its importance after the Turkish conquest of the Asia Minor by the Seljuks, and one can say that the Ottoman conquest of important cities to the west, such as Bursa, Izmir, and Istanbul, uh, brought in a kind of decline in the city's importance, yet locally it was still significant. As you can see here, uh, when the first railroads were built, Ankara was included later, although it was not directly on the Wadat line. Nevertheless, it was a rather recent drop that the 20th century observers were witnessing in Ankara. For one thing, that the commercial value of Ankara's historically famous camlet or soft fabric uh, produced from the Ankara goats, mohair, was increasingly in decline thanks to the difficult competition that the Western industrial fabrics introduced. And secondly, a very recent fire in 1916, um, really <coughs> the city suffered from this serious fire that lasted for uh, three days. It ruined 1900 buildings. Thus, Ankara was a rather poor town of 20,000 people when the Republic decided to make it its capital, yet the population was four times that uh, just a decade ago. Therefore, it is safe to say that Ankara had the potential to become a major town again. And indeed, it grew fast. As a matter of fact, it grew much faster than the first plan by German planner Hermann Janssen predicted in 1928. His plan was considered for 50 years and with a population of 300,000 people, yet on the halfway, even in 1955, the population, population had already reached uh, 450,000 people, and a new plan had to be prepared. The swift and unforeseen growth of the city has created many problems, an illegal or poorly planned housing solution being just one of them, which extend into the present urban condition. For long, Ankara has all sorts of issues that many developing contemporary metropolis have. It is a strong construction industry, and it has a very lively real estate environment that is encouraged by the political power at all costs, and even when the law or the common sense dictates otherwise. And the local government, for a very long time, is run by a conservative party who do not hide how distant they are to any idea of a modern heritage. And they are distant to it politically, and it is a rather straightforward position, but I would also like to comment that it's interesting and quite unfortunate for the sake of the modern heritage how the liberal critics of the city ran a very similar course until very recently. Uh, they usually saw the city not through what it generates as a city, but as what it is assigned to represent. Uh, Ankara has mostly been pictured by many people as a stage that state ideology is propagated and is a monumental empty sign. Actually, the new capital Ankara, all at once, um, was the experimentation ground, the showcase, and the leading model in the search for the new republican urban space. Therefore, it is natural that the architectural and urban artifacts from the early republican period of the city provide a quite efficient reading if one wishes to study architecture as a concrete materialization of state ideology. Alternatively, I would also like to propose that such readings, though certainly appreciated, 
may also tend to do the history of the city injustice in the ways that they excessively and exclusively dwell on the issue of identity politics and reduce architecture to just function of representation. I hesitate aligning early Republican architectural culture to just the representation of identity simply because such, pers such a perspective does not recount the variety and diversity of the components that make up the modernization program of both the late Ottomans and early Republicans. I believe one can observe that the very problematic state that the modern heritage of Ankara is in right now is related that it is often being treated that way. I will now here try to present some very limited number of examples among many in the effort of providing a glimpse of what I mean. And it's very similar to what uh, Professor Kalm was mentioning this morning. I'm trying to picture Ankara not as a monument of modern society, but as an infrastructure of modern society. So, Ankara, <coughs> in this, you know, uh, effort, was the capital, the new administrative center, and so the priority of the program was on the administrative component in this whole uh, modern building program. The initial plans decided to provide a completely new development for this, for the administrative part, and it was also a measure of uh, conserving the historic town and the citadel. The old town was uh, in and around the citadel to the north, and the new town, and it was the name of the area, with the new administrative center and the housing that it required was developed to the south. The boulevard connecting the two was planned as a major spine spanning the city microform with major commercial and cultural functions attached to it. The railroad station was already uh, situated to the southwest before the Yansan plan and the area between that and the old, uh, old part, old city was planned as a west major recreational area with large parks and sport facilities and etc. The administrative center in the new town was for its time quite grand and prestigious, but, uh, but the administrative reform was not only about providing the new state with the new seat of power, it was a, also building up a modern system of public services, of uh, massive transportation and communication. Accordingly, one should also observe that smaller installments of related state public service institutions were also important parts of the modernization narrative scattered all around the city, uh, all around the urban spaces, first in Ankara and eventually in every town and city in the country. In fact, a very good place to read the modernization narrative that I'm uh, trying to picture here through the urban space of Ankara would be the boulevard itself as the main axis that connects the old and the new towns. Again, to be rather quick, I will just list some of the buildings here from the late 20s to 30s. And I will begin with this one on the south end. This is uh, the Institute of Public Hygiene. It is very close to the Ministry of Health. And this institution itself is a brand new creation for the Republic, not just the building. Now, just a little bit north is Girls Institute. It's again a new in, uh, educational institution, uh, as as an you know educational institution designed exclusively to compensate the ages of ages old neg negligence of uh, education of the nation's young females. So the institution is also new, and the building is just on the very prestigious axis on the boulevard. Just next to it is another uh, high school for girls, and uh, a little bit east to both is a mixed high school. Just next to those buildings is Turkish Aviation Institute, and there's an aviation school just behind it. This institution, this institute had plane factories, in fact, and a wind tunnel for the design of those planes, in both in Ankara and Eskişehir. Now move further north on the boulevard, there is these two uh, cultural buildings, the Ethnography Museum and the Performance Hall and the Library for the People's Halls. They are both earlier than the plan and you would uh, see, you will observe that their styles is also rather old. Uh, it, was, it was the 
trending architectural style in the late Ottoman period as, as some kind of an Ottoman rivalism. It was the, you know, the actual thing when the Republic was found, so they used it for some time and then moved on shift to do more contemporary approach. And then just uh, further north, we have the Banks Street. Uh, they are the headquarters of the banks that invest heavily in the large-scale industrial projects. Uh, this, this happens in the absence of a very significant capitalist class. So there is no capitalist class and the state is uh, relying heavily on these banks. Many of them are uh, state banks to you know, um, initiate an in industrialization. And their headquarters are in this uh, bank street. Uh, as an example, Ish Bank, one of those banks, Ish Bank is, uh, it, this one is taking on buying out rich coal mines in the north coast and they are modernizing mining activities among many other tasks. Later in a few years, some more specialized banks will assume this role, uh, the role of the industrial entrepreneur. Such one is Etibank and another one is Sumer Bank. Etibank is involved in mining and Sumer Bank is involved in textile and industries and they're all at uh, these headquarters in this par uh, part of the city. Now, as an example, this Sumer Bank uh, has created all these factories intentionally outside the already industrialized parts of the country so that the, the modernizing effect of these uh, entities will be spread out towards the nation and uh, examples of some textile factories they have built so far. So what I want to emphasize here is the totality of, of the program that these buildings should be re read in. And when we read them, and not just look at them with the specifics of their architectural styles or expression, the narrative that they provide is the real Ankara project, which I define as an economic and cultural rebalancing and the redistribution of the nation's resources and the productive dynamics that those resources are poured in. It was, uh, I believe, which this, this narrative um, makes up as, as the Ankara project. This narrative is more about the institutions and the people, it's more about their engagements and their motives, the structure themselves, structures and the buildings themselves are eventually just figures in conveying the narrative in the overall collective memory, even if those people, the institutions and even the, the, the motivations are all now gone. Well, what the architecture itself represents in this narrative, to, um, it's although um, quite essential for us as architectural historians, we can observe it, it has not helped us much in our efforts of the conservation of the modern heritage. I have mentioned earlier that raising an awareness in, in, in this cause is hard in Ankara because the ordinary citizen has lost connect, contact to the narrative of the past. And now I'm, I'm adding to that, maybe that is also because we are narrating it poorly. I believe we should focus more into underlining the fact that the cities and the Republic's modern program was not built upon a fixation on what is modern and what is not, but I think it was an ongoing search for, for the contemporary. They were searching for the contemporary. And I'm, I'm putting this as an example. Now, in this search, a series of architectural styles keep, kept replacing each other, and each time, when, when a new style was brought in as the most contemporary thing, the other was seen as outdated, so that this, this, this program was about how, how we can fastly catch up with the modern society, the contemporary civilization. So it was going on. It was, again, a very uh, interesting example of continuity and discontinuity happening at the same time. And all through this time, the city continued to generate an urban experience of its own with a vocabulary that is not only visual. And I believe it went fine for a quiet time. At around the end of the century, I, I, um, I would say that Ankara lost it. It was quite fine until around the end of the century. And I would or illustrate that with this example. 
it's not an example of a lost building, but you'll see. I was talking about Ishbankas, you know, uh, modernizing the mining industry. This is their first headquarters in, in the old town in Ankara, that Ottoman revivalist style. This is their later headquarters in 1977, built in, in a, let's say, kind of a neo-brutalist architectural approach. And this is still one of the finest tall buildings in, in the city. And the third one illustrates, illustrates what I'm trying to say. This one is their new uh, headquarters. Well, the building is quite fine. It's designed by Tekelisi, so it's a very important partnership that spanned all the second half of 20th century uh, architecture in Turkey. But the problem is uh, visually this slide. On the top part of the picture, you will see that it is in Ankara. Uh, sorry, it's in Istanbul. It's not in Ankara. <laughs> so that's what I'm saying. This, this, um, this very important, very significant, this vast uh, republican uh, creation, this economic entity that is usually, you know, aligned with the republican ideals, has moved their headquarters to Istanbul in the year 2000. Of course, this is not the cause of why Ankara lost it, but it's a sign uh, of what's going on. Now, we can say that Istanbul is again one uh, massively heavy primate city, and Ankara, maybe that's why Ankara has, you know, uh, left with the ambiguous identity crisis that we have been experiencing for some time, where the rush to replace the modern heritage with a retro fantasy of the contemporary is what seems to be all there is. So, thank you.